How wonderful is this? It's really an honor to be here today and in person to share this incredibly important day with you. Graduating from Brown, one of the finest and most august universities in the world. Class of 2022, congratulations, you've done it. 44 years ago, I sat here and I was very keen to collect my diploma and get out into the world. But I was also anxious about what awaited me beyond these doors. Could I achieve my ambitious goals and make a difference? For me, a middle-class kid growing up in the projects, it was Brown that made me feel like I could. The values it instills really gave me a sense of purpose and passion for the pursuit of truth and a desire to always strive to do the right thing. And that has stayed with me and guided me to this day. So thank you, Brown. I remember when I first arrived, the intellectual candy was intoxicating. I was admitted then to the seven-year PLME program, meaning I would skip a year of college. As an impatient kid, that seemed like a great idea, but now I know the amazing brown opportunities I missed. As you just heard, I really did take advantage of the open curriculum. For example, I studied African literature and politics and became dear friends with the professor Anani Gigienio, who just died a few years ago. I also got in trouble with my medical school anatomy professor because I skipped some anatomy lessons, which he thought was the most important thing in the world, so I could attend an epic classics course by the amazing John Rowe Workman. What amazing opportunities. Anani and Stanley Aronson, the founding dean of the medical school, who today would have turned 100 years old, encouraged me to explore the world, taking my first trip to Africa, studying tropical medicine in Brazil. So when I finished medical school with a real love of clinical medicine, completing my training in that other university in that little city to the north, I came to realize that by switching to public health and infectious disease epidemiology, I could make even more of an impact. As a physician, I could help individual people, but in public health, I potentially could help millions. As it turns out, the organization that I now head, Gavi the Vaccine Alliance, where I've been CEO for more than a decade, helps protect the lives not of millions, but of hundreds of millions by improving access to vaccines. Since it was founded in 2000, we've protected more than 900 million of the world's most vulnerable children from deadly infectious diseases by introducing 550 new vaccines, reducing vaccine preventable diseases by 70% and preventing more than 15 million deaths. Then along came COVID and the stakes got even higher. With eyes wide open, I helped put Gavi at the center of the global vaccination effort, co-creating COVAX. Suddenly, we were now looking at protecting billions of people. This is one reason I was drawn to the world of immunization, because vaccines make such a huge difference to the lives of so many. Arguably, no other health intervention has had such a far-reaching impact. Because of vaccines, one of the deadliest, most disfiguring and feared diseases, smallpox, has been completely eradicated. Although, of course, monkeypox is back in the news. And polio, which used to be second only to the atomic bomb as the thing most feared by Americans, is down to a handful of cases. These are some of the greatest achievements of modern medicine. Now, I worked in many areas of global public health, but I first got involved in a major way through my work quantifying the early epidemiology of AIDS in Africa. Then at the Rockefeller Foundation, I founded and ran the first international organization solely dedicated to drive research and development into HIV AIDS vaccines for developing countries, the International AIDS Vaccine Initiative, or IAVI. Why? because there was very little research and development into AIDS vaccines for developing countries, partially because the science wasn't easy, but also because there was no market. Now think about that for a minute. Even though there was the potential to prevent millions of people from getting this terrible disease, there were little investment because not 
enough people would be able to afford to pay for them. To me, this just didn't seem right. This kind of market failure wasn't unique to AIDS vaccines, and in fact, one of the reasons Gavi was created. New and powerful vaccines were being developed for wealthy countries, but they were not reaching children in poor countries who arguably most needed them. Now, there's a bunch of complex reasons behind this, but essentially it comes down to two fundamental things, making vaccines affordable and having systems to deliver them. Affordability is a tough challenge. Vaccines are made from living things and so much more expensive to develop and manufacture than drugs. We're talking about incredibly complex molecules or even organisms, and their production requires hundreds of thousands of steps and a lot of oversight. We tackled this problem by creating markets, by pooling demand on behalf of the 73 poorest countries we were able to go to manufacturers and say, we need this number of vaccines for at least this number of years, and given the economies of scale, what's your best price? At the same time, we would encourage other, particularly developing country manufacturers, to enter the market and develop new vaccines, and creating both innovation and competition, which help brings prices down. So to manufacturers, this was in stark contrast to dealing with individual governments requesting small volumes with no predictability and enabled them to do the right thing, to help protect hundreds of millions of the world's most vulnerable children while still protecting their shareholders' interests by growing their markets. A good example of this is the HPV vaccine, which protects against cervical cancer, the largest cancer killer of women in many developing countries. Initially only available in wealthy nations at a cost of over $450 a course, we brought that down just to $4.50. By achieving similar gains with other vaccines, the cost of fully immunize a child with all the 11 WHO recommended vaccines is now $25. In the US, it's closer to $1,200. So we provide vaccines for about half of the world's children and have helped dramatically increase immunization coverage. And because of price reductions and stable markets we help create, countries are able to transition out of our support and start to pay for the vaccines themselves as their economies grow. And now 17 countries are fully financing their own vaccines. In, a, in other words, it's a hand up and not a handout. But when it comes to diseases of epidemic or pandemic potential, things are a little different as we've seen with COVID. We got our first taste of this in 2014 with the Ebola epidemic in West Africa. Here you had a horrific disease for which vaccine candidates had already been developed because it was perceived to be a potential biological weapon. But rather than being brought to market, they just sat in a freezer for a decade. Why? Because outbreaks were a rare occurrence, affecting a few hundred people living in the most impoverished African rural communities. Where's the market in that? How could manufacturers ever expect to see a return on investing half a billion dollars to build a vaccine production facility when your only customers were a handful of impoverished farmers? But this outbreak threatening the world was a wake-up call the largest ever, which ultimately infected more than 28,000 people, killing more than 11,000. Suddenly, diseases like Ebola were being viewed differently, but we still needed manufacturing investments and a market. So we developed a new financial mechanism called an advanced purchase commitment, where we signed a legal binding commitment to pay for a certain number of doses once approved. And in the meantime, the manufacturers agreed to provide emergency doses of the investigational vaccine under special licensure for compassionate use if any outbreaks occurred before that time, which, of course, they did. This meant rather than having to wait for an Ebola outbreak to occur and then wondering why we didn't have vaccines, we had doses ready to use whenever we needed them. The message seemed to be sinking in. In 2015, Bill Gates and I did back-to-back -back TED Talks making precisely this point, that the world needed to stop waiting until diseases like Ebola became a threat to global health security before treating them like one. The right thing to do is to anticipate such threats, be prepared to react, and get vaccine development rolling in advance. 
This also led to the creation of CEPI, the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations, an organization which I'm proud to say I played a role in setting up, which fund research and developments into vaccines for epidemic threats. If the lack of a market was the problem for Ebola, then with COVID, the opposite has been the case. On January 23rd, 2020, I was sitting in the Hard Rock Cafe at the World Economic in Forum in Davos with my wife, Cynthia, who's seated right over there, um, and a friend, Richard Hatchett, the CEO of CEPI. News had been filtering through of a novel form of pneumonia emerging from Wuhan in China. Down the street, President Trump was giving a news conference saying there was absolutely no risk, but we immediately understood the implications. The question was, is this the big one or is it a dress rehearsal for the big one? We knew that our best defense against such a threat lay with vaccines, but we knew that even if they could be developed fast enough, there was a big chance we'd see a repeat of what happened with the last pandemic in 2009 when a handful of wealthy governments bought up almost the entire global supply of swine flu vaccine, leaving almost none for the rest of the world. This was particularly a risk at this moment in history when nationalism was on the rise. So we hatched a plan to help to prevent this from happening again. That day, CEPI provided seed funding for the first clinical lots of Moderna and the Oxford vaccine, and we sketched what we thought would work as a global solution to ensure that people in all corners of the world could get access to successful COVID-19 vaccines, no matter how rich or poor they were. This discussion ultimately led to the blueprint for COVAX, the largest multilateral effort since the Paris Climate Agreement, which brought together 195 governments along with global health organizations, manufacturers, scientists, private sector, civil society, and philanthropy. Its aim, to ensure that COVID-19 vaccines would be equitably available. Things got really complicated after that. People in governments were panicked, so we had to get creative. We knew that wealthy governments would make bilateral deals with manufacturers even before the clinical trials began, and moreover, would be willing to pay almost anything for doses. So we created a mechanism to pool demand from the poor nations to create the collective bargaining and political power needed to compete with the big guys. Using donor funds, this mechanism, the Gavi COVAX Advanced Market Commitment, or AMC, would provide doses free of charge to people living in the 92 poorest nations who would be least able to buy them on the open market. These countries represent roughly half the world's population. As of today, COVAX has delivered greater than 1.5 billion doses to 145 countries, with about 90% of these going to people living in those lower income countries that would otherwise have struggled to gain access. And we've got billions of more doses to come. But it hasn't been easy. All of this was done in the, con in the context of great uncertainty. For starters, we didn't know if any of the vaccines would work. Developing a safe and effective vaccine normally takes many years, and even those that make it as far as clinical trials normally have a small chance of making it to market. So we built the world's largest portfolio of 12 vaccines. And we started without any money. We had to raise funds as we went, which delayed our ability to secure deals with manufacturers early on at a time when it was most critical. Despite all this, we did get there. Remarkably, unlike with HIV, science delivered, and the world has, has now more than two dozen vaccines, and the first took just 327 days to develop a new record. And with an intense effort on Zoom, my team and I were able to raise the funding COVAX needed, about $13 billion over the last two years. Plus, when doses were scarce, getting a billion additional doses donated from high-income countries. And perhaps most importantly, getting doses to people in lower-income countries, which historically could take over a decade, just 39 days after the first shots were given in high-income countries. So I'm incredibly proud to say that COVAX worked and continues to work, and frankly, thank God it does, because without it, there would be no other truly global solution and the world would be in a much worse place. That said, we could have done much better. 
Despite our best efforts to convince the world to do the right thing by removing the financial barriers to COVID vaccines, we repeatedly came across other obstacles which delayed or hindered our ability to make equitable access possible. Vaccine hoarding by wealthy nations was always anticipated, but this, along with export restrictions on vaccines and their components by governments and a lack of transparency from manufacturers, have really hindered COVAX's ability to get doses to people rapidly, which ultimately prolonged the pandemic. And inequality still exists. Despite having reached now 46% of people in the 92 poorest countries with at least two doses, compared to 60% global coverage, there are still 18 low-income, mostly fragile countries with coverage less than 10%. In a pandemic, you are only safe if we are all safe. How do we make all of our leaders act on this? We've seen some national leaders and manufacturers voice their support for COVAX with one breath and then take actions that simultaneously undermine its mission. This is perhaps one of the most important and difficult take-homes of this crisis. Competing priorities will always be an issue during a pandemic, but doing what's right for you sometimes means doing what's right for others. And if we want to repeat, avoid a repeat of this global disaster on this scale um, with the next pandemic, and believe me, it's evolutionarily certain that there will be a next one, then we need to get this right. At the same time, COVID has fueled a sudden global increase in vaccine hesitancy. Part of this comes from some people's genuine worry about the speed at which these vaccines have been developed, but it also has been driven by intentional anti-vaccine propaganda and nefarious social media campaigns from governments trying to destabilize societies. When I graduated from Brown, the button I wore said, question authority. Today, it perhaps should say, question authenticity. Anti-vaxxers have been around as long as vaccines, choosing to ignore or perhaps misunderstand the sheer weight of the scientific evidence in favor of safety and the effectiveness of vaccines. They are a prime example of what happens when you conflate truth with conviction. As Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan once put it, everyone is entitled to their own opinion, but not their own facts. Yet for over a century, anti-vaxxers have been disseminating their opinions as fact. When COVID came along, they seized the moment, used partisan politics, preying on the slightest doubt and concerns the public had, and built new political alliances. Despite the United States being the richest and, and most scientifically advanced country in the world, today about one third of Americans are still not vaccinated with a primary series, even after the grim milestone a few weeks ago of passing one million deaths. And although we all want to be done with the virus, I am not sure the virus is done with us. So this is part of my story, and, and I am incredibly proud of what we've achieved. Yes, I've been called naive, overly ambitious, and I've been the chief pinata when things didn't go as planned, even when they were due to things out of our control. But criticism should not discourage you from doing the right thing. As Margaret Mead has said, Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed people can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. Because of Gavi, vaccines are the most widely distributed health intervention in the world. And during a pandemic, there is no reason we cannot provide vaccines to all those who are willing to take them. After all, it's not only the right thing to do, but also in our collective best interests. Now, I imagine you're itching to get out these doors, see your family, collect your diplomas, and see what the world has to offer you and what you can offer the world. But before I finish, I'd like to end by acknowledging what you have done during COVID. You've not only got through your degrees, you have done so while surviving a pandemic. Not easy, especially when it forced you to sacrifice so much of the Brown experience. So no matter where your life takes you or where in the world you go, it's important that you carry with you the Brown values as part of your moral compass and continue to strive for the principles of truth, respect for science and fairness, and that you find what is right for you and do it. It is also why when you walk through these doors, 
We need you to become champions of the truth. As Orwell once said, in a time of deceit, telling the truth is a revolutionary act. That means we are depending upon you to become the revolutionaries, the champions of the truth that we all need. And don't forget that Brown is now part of your family, so don't be a stranger. DiGienio, Aronson, and I remain friends for life. Whenever I returned to give lectures in their courses, it tickled them both to hear about how I was directly making differences in people's lives around the globe. I'm sure there are professors here who would love to hear how you are all doing, too. I'd like to end by telling you how incredibly honored and privileged I feel to have been invited to speak here today on this very special day. Whatever lies in store for you beyond these doors, whatever path you take, I wish you the best of luck. Congratulations.